Okay, now let's take a little uh, tour back through everything that we've looked at and look at some of the main themes and kind of do a little wrap up here of this humanities course. You remember some of the main themes that we said we were going to look at throughout these 12 lectures were the birth and the maturation of the whole idea of individualism, okay? Uh, and so uh, this is something that we, we can trace out through each of these uh, 12 lectures. Uh, the rise of modern science, the rise of technology, and the increase of its power uh, over society was another theme. Also, the decline of religious influence uh, and the decline of the idea of the transcendent in any shape, fashion, or form was another theme. And then last, we said we were going to look at the rise of the social contract, the, the rise of a new idea of governance, rule by consent. Um, and we see that that does lead to a kind of a social construction theories of reality, social construction of political reality, if you will. Okay. So we've seen each one of these themes uh, morph and change, uh, develop, evolve, and so forth and so on. In one way or another, we've definitely seen the decline of religious influence. Uh, and that's kind of what uh, we just saw with, um, with Lewis. Uh, he's dealing with that. I mean, he dealt with it himself personally as an atheist becomes a Christian, a theist, then a Christian, uh, and then an apologist for Christianity. Uh, he grew up in an atheistic world, and so he was already in an age, late 19th century, early 20th century, where atheism had almost become the norm in the intellectual world. Okay, and so as we get down to today here uh, in America, we see the same thing, where the secular age that we live in, as Charles Taylor called it, is an age where disbelief is somewhat the standard position and that it's, uh, it's almost like we have uh, kind of entered into a situation much like uh, Lewis had there at Oxford. Disbelief was the standard position. Uh, it was quite remarkable if someone stepped out of disbelief and decided to believe in God or Christ, okay? And such is the same today. Um, uh, even to step out of the world of the secular uh, world of disbelief and believe in some kind of a transcendent is, um, is, is somewhat unusual. Uh, though there are a lot of people today who try to cut a middle path and say, well, I'm spiritual, I'm not religious. In other words, I believe that there's something larger than myself, something larger than us, uh, larger than this earth or this cosmos, if you will, but I don't want to have anything to do with a, any type of a system or any type of an organized view of such things, okay? So they won't go into a religion. Um, because it's perceived that, well, systematized uh, beliefs are somehow or another too dogmatic and they just don't fit in our age. And so this is what uh, Taylor, for example, calls the malaise, the modern malaise that we feel and uh, that we're pulled in many different directions and there's so many different competing visions and beliefs and so forth. There are tens of thousands, in fact, different religious groups and so forth and views out there. So a lot of people just decide to not follow any of them and just kind of go their own way and agree that, yeah, there's something larger than me out there. But does that ever come back into their daily life and inform them on how to act, how to think, and so forth and so on? No, again, they're almost like the person without the chest. There's nothing to translate that into their daily life too much, okay? Especially when you're just a one-off, okay? It's very difficult to just have a one-off view of reality um, and, and, and to make that something sustainable in this you know, world of flux. And this is why many people do wind up in little religious groups. But now you're back into the organized view of, uh, of reality. The individualism has reached a kind of fevered pitch in our society today. We are in a hyper-individualistic age, but it is leading to some absurdities. It is itself leading to some reductio ad absurdum. Um, when an individual so much wants to make himself or herself unique and unlike anyone else, it leads to loneliness. It leads to um, kind of a, an, an inability to, to identify with other people. 
And so it winds up with a lot of loneliness. And this is a big problem for our society today, especially since we have, the, again, the technologies and so forth and so on to revert into our own little individualistic bubble. And those technologies, as we know, are only growing powerful every day. And within a very soon uh, coming day, we'll be able to revert back into some virtual reality in which we really never come out, okay? Um, it's like Ready Player One, in a sense, you know, or something like that. We, we are going to uh, be able to construct our own fantasies and live there. Uh, at least that's what some people dream of. Uh, but individualism is almost run amok. It's gone so far uh, that it, it, we, one wonders if it can go any further without ultimately breaking down. Uh, but it does. When it destroys, when individualism destroys the individual, then I think we've re reached that in, uh, reductio ad absurdum. And it seems that we've, we're very close to that. Individualism is a dead end when taken, again, one value taken to the extreme. Okay. Um, so the birth and maturation of individualism may be beyond ma uh, maturation now and may be decrepit and in the, the point of old age, if you will, and reaching its, uh, its final lifespan. Um, uh, but the modern science, the technology and so forth that we, that we have feeds right into that, allowing us to create our own realities as we wish. Uh, rule by consent is something that we've seen emerge. Uh, the, the kind of the radical egalitarian projects that our society is headed towards. This, this idea that, you know, this is, sometimes it runs up against individualism. We want everyone to be individual and to choose their own path and so forth and so on, but we're very leery at letting someone do that to the point where it's at the sacrifice of someone else's freedom, okay? So we have now political systems, democracy, and we're, some people want to move us more and more and more towards a kind of a radical or pure democracies where individuals uh, have a say-so and everything that goes on in our society, okay? All the rules and the laws and so forth and so on. But anyway, individualism and democracy, you can see they are synergistically, um, you know, um, powered together in a kind of dy dynamism along with our technology and so forth. And all of this, again, uh, has brought a great challenge against traditional morality, uh, traditional views of uh, religion and transcendence and so forth. And so now we're in an age of, of a kind of a weak, watered down spirituality, if anything. Uh, an age of agnosticism, an age of unbelief, growing age of atheism and so forth. Um, it's somewhat powered by those three or four great atheists that we saw from the 19th century, especially Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, and Darwin too. Even though Darwin didn't avidly promote atheism, he gave a final piece of the picture there, a naturalistic view of humanity. So we could explore all kinds of other uh, themes that spin off from these, but I think you can see these, that the world has changed so much f from where we started back with the Renaissance and uh, 14th century uh, Italian uh, society. Uh, the, the, the shifts have been dramatic uh, from there up to Luther, the beginning of modernity, birth of modern science, uh, British empiricism and rationalism, and then on to the Kantian moment, the divorcing of faith and reason. All of these things along the way have contributed in one way or another to all of these themes. And so uh, what I hope is that we can have greater understanding. That's always one of my, my overall arching objectives is to help my students have greater understanding of the moment they're in. Uh, how did we get here? Uh, and how we got here is, is going to help us to understand what we should do next and maybe become critical of some things that we had not been aware of. Uh, can, I think people like Lewis can help us to see some of the dangers and so forth and see some of the, the, the perhaps bad endings of certain ways that we think. 
Now, Lewis inspired uh, Richard Weaver to write a little book, Ideas Have Consequences, and a very thought-provoking work in itself. Ideas do have consequences in the real world, and sometimes those consequences are cataclysmic. Uh, they're earth-changing, if you will. They, they lead to uh, great cataclysmic events like World War I and World War II. Um, and these ideas can be quite harrowing and anti-humanitarian. And so we need to look at that and, and revisit from a kind of a global perspective and a kind of a rise above it if we can. What is it that humanizes us? What is it that makes us human? And I fully agree with Lewis. Uh, that's my position. Uh, it's no secret I'm a Christian, I'm a theist, uh, and I believe that uh, Lewis's uh, thought is, is a very good answer to modernity. And not that he's completely without problems or you know little details and so forth and so on, but I think that his overarching answer is correct. Scientism, materialism, uh, it leads us to a very harrowing uh, kind of dangerous view of humanity that could end badly. And so we need to turn back to that which human, humanizes us and look to God, the source of our humanity, or look to a transcendent value. So I hope you've enjoyed these lectures and uh, look forward to seeing you again someday. And have a good day.